afternoon. Welcome to Edgefield University. I'm uh, here today. I'm Sarah Willington. I'm a creative writing student. This is Denise Walton, one of the, uh, my fellow students. Um, we're joined today by uh, ex Hawkwind member and uh, Hawk Lords musician Harvey Bainbridge and uh, author and screenwriter Stephen Jansen. Hello. Hello. Howdy doody. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, we're here today to talk about the book that you've written together, mm. The Light from Dead Stars. Yeah. Um, so how did this come about? What was your inspiration for the book? You know, basically, it was um, a lot of my interest in very, very loud and powerful music. Right. And when I was younger, I saw Harvey when he played in Hawkwind and um, continued to listen to the albums as years went by. And later on, I was introduced to him. And uh, it came about that it would be a good idea with Harvey's experience to tour anecdotes and me wanted to write a basically fun caper novel that we could put the two together. So, so in the book, is it all based on Harvey's adventures in Hawkwind. Yeah, ninety percent of them. Yeah, a lot of them are sort of generic rock anecdotes, but most of them are Harvey's um, yeah. nightmare journey across the landscape, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, with a chase element fixed into that, so it it runs. Right. Mm -hmm. And was, was it hard work trying to remember all that, Harvey? Well, not really hard work trying to remember. It's because it's one of those things that um, you spend an afternoon, a few hours, sort of sitting talking about these things. And Steve's frantically scribbling while I'm talking. <laughs> And then uh, I'm thinking, well, I'm sure there's other things I can remember. And then they carry on for a while. Then, and Steve decides, well, I think I've got enough now. And then, I, then he goes. And then I think, last, there was something. And he said something else then for a minute. There, God, I should have talked about this, something else. Because yeah. so, once you start regurgitating mem memories. One you know, source of ignites. One, it, one, mm -hmm. yeah. Then it starts, yeah. you can start dragging them out of your, you, you know, your your mind and uh, and even you go to bed that night and you think oh god damn it yes that happened as well you know and uh, well there's some funny stuff in the book i mean there's yeah. uh, the instance with the uh, rubber chicken uh, how did that all come about no well the rubber chicken thing was uh, <laughs> came later on actually I, I i kept trying to write the book and it kept stalling at chapter four right. because one of harvey's things was telling me about being on the road is it just becomes a repetitive bubble yeah and you find if you write about a repetitive bubble that's exactly what you get mm. there yeah. was no engine driving driving the book and then Harvey told me one instance where uh, a band member threw his trophy rubber chicken off his keyboard and into the crowd and he was rather upset about that because the Roku had dressed it up in a flight jacket and goggles and things and it was kind of personal so it went I thought well there you go then now I thought well what if there was something important about the chicken that Harvey needed to get back <laughs> So that came the chase element because the other side of the book is the fan that catches it and tries yeah. to return it yeah. to Harvey, yeah. not knowing there's something really, really important inside the chicken. <laughs> that is what basically. So he wasn't just a mascot. No, no, no international no. drug smuggling. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. Oh. So we've chained it to something that everybody's after. That's inside this chicken. Well, that half, sounds yeah. like a brilliant plot. Yeah. Yeah. Half the people that handle the chicken don't know it's in there. And it just gets <laughs> passed. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. Oh, was there a story that you said about? Didn't you once go to a gig and somebody threw a load of chicken? Yeah, back well, out how you. it started really was that uh, we used to play jokes on each other when we were touring to alleviate, alleviate the boredom of travelling around. So there'd be whoopee cushions without you realise, you know, silly things like stink bombs, even you know, little explosive caps that you drop on the floor and make people jump. And I was in the joke shop and I saw this rubber chicken, you know, that sort of size, and I thought, oh, that sounds like fun. I can throw that at somebody <laughs> you know, when I get bored. So I bought this rubber chicken, and um, that night on stage we were playing something, and little little Alan Davy was playing the bass in those days, and uh, and he was doing some. He was kind of being the rock star at the front. So I decided I was going to hurl my rubber chicken at him just to <laughs> just, just to, to be little him a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so it did, it clocked him and he kind of wondered what was going on and he saw what it was, so he lobbed it back. <laughs> and uh, and as, as usual, we had a really good light show and when the strobes all came on for one number, I thought it'd be good fun to lob it into the audience mm. to see if... To follow it. <laughs> to yeah. follow it down. Yeah. And uh, so the strobes all came on, so I lobbed it into the audience thinking, well, that's the last I've seen of that. And... Uh, Lo and behold, it came back. <laughs> Suddenly, <laughs> like it just, a boom rank. <laughs> yeah, it came back. So uh, anyway, so it kind of flung it around a bit and it kept coming back. So it was there, I had it back at the end of the gig and went off to the next next town and um, had I had the chicken again. And so I thought, well, again, I'll fling it, you know, this is, I'll fling it at somebody. And uh, 
So I flung it into the audience that next gig, and uh, and as I kind of looked up, this hail of rubber chickens <laughs> came back <laughs> from the audience. <laughs> and it's, and <laughs> on that, and yeah. I thought, what the bloody hell is going on here? But you know, it was just a hail of rubber yeah, chickens. Yeah. And I was talking to some of the guys after the, after the gig, and they said, oh, yes, we've all been to the joke shop. <laughs> we, they've sold out of rubber chickens <laughs> in the joke shops in town. Mm. Honestly, the, about 20 or 30 rubber chickens came flying that back. That sounds like something uh, the young ones would do on Facebook now, isn't it? Like, we're going to this concert, so mm. all bring a rubber chicken. chicken. Yeah. 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 That, would, that would go viral now, wouldn't yeah, it? Like yeah, yeah. Chickens. You'd have yeah. 30,000 chickens. chickens. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the difference then in them days, how people did things, the experienced it there, whereas now you it's know, all... Yeah. The other thing yeah. about the, the whole Hawkwind as well was that you had people follow you round from gig to gig to yeah. gig. And yeah. As I was saying earlier, that you had people taking their holidays to coincide, Around your gigs, yeah. Yeah. To coincide mm -hmm. with the tours, you know. Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, I was just going to ask you, Stephen, uh, what was it like writing the books? It's quite a big book, isn't it? Yeah. Did it, it initially uh, start off with the idea of being a lot smaller? Oh, yeah. yeah uh, 80 it was an interview. It was. It was, yeah, it was <laughs> oh, you're started, right, yeah. right. It was going to be about a two-page interview with Harvey. Right. And then I spent the afternoon rolling on the floor laughing at all the things he was telling me, and I thought, well, this why not do a biography, but Avi wasn't interested in doing a, a biography, so why don't we just take all the anecdotes and turn it into a chase novel? Yeah. So we'll do that, and I thought, well, yeah, 80,000 words should cover it, it's a standard novel length. And it just kept going and going, and as Harvey says, you keep remembering things, so yeah. I'd Pandora's go... Pandora's box, yeah. really, yeah. It I'd is, really, yeah. 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 I'd go back yeah. and he'd tell me some more, and then, oh, that, that links to that, and it would just keep going, it's... Was it a long... Did, how long did it take you to put it all together? Uh, well, in between all the other writing it was started in 2008 and i think i finished it in 2011. yeah right but it was it's 143,000 words now now the first four <laughs> chapters of that are available free online mm. aren't that's they? right yeah if you uh, if you type in uh, the light from dead stars harvey bainbridge stephen jansen it will bring it up on google yeah. and it will lead you to a website where you can read four chapters for free right and, uh, and uh, where's the rest of is the rest of the book going to become available yes yeah, so that's available in about two weeks we're looking at first week of may right and that's going to be available on our website called Feed a Read. Right. It's, uh, feed, then the letter A, Read. And you'll be able to either download it to Kindle or you can buy it hard copy because it's yeah. a pay as you order site. Yeah. Uh, after that, well, we're obviously open for bookshops. Right, fantastic, but, uh, yeah. fantastic. And a sequel. And a sequel. I look, I look oh, right, to is there going to be a yes. sequel? Yes. Right. Brisbane keeps hustling me for a sequel. Yeah. Right, yeah. so I have, I is, it, got, is uh, it more adventures? Will it yeah. be the same? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll probably get the same people in it, but uh, I'm thinking we Moscow. We haven't been to Australia yet, have we? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Isn't that the thing that actually, <laughs> although you were a fan of Hawkwind, weren't mm. you, and that's how it yeah. came mm. about, it, there's actually characters in it that you knew that attended yeah, concerts the, that, that the Harvey opposite, actually performed at. Mm, the opposite side of the book is uh, two characters from an audience point of view, and they're, uh, they're real people, yeah. The character of Cotton Dave and South Central Kelly right. are real people who, yeah. like to say, took holidays to follow Hawkwind. So, the, so. Do, do you remember the ideas that, because you, you've met yes, Cotton yeah, Dave and that, yeah. so do you yeah. remember ideas about each other, what happened, does he yeah, remember well, things? Yeah, well, they, you know, yes, they, they see it from another point of view, basically. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit like I was, I was saying, they can almost, they can isolate a time and a place much better than I can. Yeah. Where something occurred. Yeah, yeah. I can remember it occurring, but I'm going, well, was it? Yeah. No, it was. No, it wasn't. It was there. No, it yeah. wasn't. It <laughs> yeah. must have been there. But they can put it pinpoint, to pinpoint it, it. Yeah. Mm. because the same sort of thing happens all over the place to us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it gets very yeah. confusing as if to the, what if happens. If the two well. characters were based on real characters, mm. what, what about the first character? Then is that just someone you've completely made up? Yeah, because it voice. is actually written in first person, isn't it? Yeah, but it's written from first from uh, first person from major from two characters. The yeah. the character that represents Harvey. Right. Is Larry Bain. Right. And the character of Cotton Dave is a real guy called Dave Cotton. Right. right. So right. basically you get the two perspectives. Uh, yeah. South Central Kelly, I suppose, is a little bit of a third character who tags along. But, but he's also a real... Yeah, yeah, yeah he's a real yeah. person. Yeah, the idea was to have one chapter from the stage point of view, which would be Harvey's character, and one from the audience. Yeah. And then eventually the two meet. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of... It's, it's like bringing two split screens together. Really. Yeah. So is that quite yeah. an interesting thing for you, Harvey, getting to see the other side of it? Well, yes, yeah, yeah, or hearing it, you know. To, yeah. I mean, because um, you do meet up with people at free festivals and festivals yeah. that you play at, and you sit around and talk to them, and, yeah. and you get the perspective of an audience there as well. So what was the... Because uh, you mentioned once about the... Uh, 
the one that Cotton and Dave and yourself witnessed with the, the man asleep on the stage. What happened there? Oh, yeah. So I can't remember where the gifts. It may have been something like Hammersmith Odeon before it changed its name to the Apollo. But it's jam-packed. There's people bouncing about. And this guy climbed up on the stage. I can remember it was right in front of Dave Brock. He climbed yeah. up on the stage and he was like that for about two minutes. And then he just keeled over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, passed out and just lay there like that. And we were kind of leave, we left him there for a while, you know, and he was, <laughs> and then we got, we, you know, we get the road, beckon to the roadie to come on. And this huge roadie comes thinking, oh God, they're going to pick him up and hurl him. But they just very gently tipped him <laughs> over the edge of the stage. But what was fantastic was that this sea of people opened up swallowed this guy up and then <laughs> covered just, over again. And he just all carried and on. And that was it, yeah. <laughs> and we were all thinking, is he all right down there, you know? But yeah. we, we did see him at the end of the gig and yeah. he was he just had a grin from ear to ear. Oh. Yeah. And these, all these face. sort of little anecdotes are all yeah, in the book, the guy, aren't they? Yeah, because the guy, oh, we saw the guy roll off the stage, but Dave Cotton saw him land. <laughs> right, <laughs> So yeah, that, was, so that was the two things. Yeah. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, so I just kept, I kept doing that. I thought eventually through, through parts of the book, they'll just keep bumping into each other. Yeah. You know, trying to find this chicken, <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah, that does seem to be a lot of the focus uh, yeah. around mm. the, this chicken keeps cropping up, innit? Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. Oh, brilliant. You know, it's kind of the Holy Grail thing. They're all after this thing. Right. I just really love Torquin then, to, to inspire to write a book about it. Yeah, yeah, uh, I do. They were, um, uh, they were one, they've always been interested in bands that really play things deafening. Yes. And they were the first band that I came across that used sound as a weapon rather than right. a form of entertainment well because yeah because yeah. they were actually quite you know anarchists mm. they were known for the time weren't they i think mm. i read an interview once where it said of hawkwind they were one foot in the music business and one foot out yeah. or something is that yeah. does that sound about right that Hawkwind? sounds about right yeah. i mean the music business doesn't didn't really like hawkwind very much because um the funny thing about hawkwind i th i found was uh, um as it grew in its years it the, the the audience kept kept coming along to to yeah. see live shows, but the record sales just fell away. Yeah. Um, so uh, really, it was a it it was a band that played to people as opposed to sitting in a studio making records to yeah. sell to people. Yeah. So it became a figurehead of anarchic. Uh, of an, uh, an, an, an anarchic <laughs> yeah. way of life. Oh, like I'm that. glad you did that hard. And, uh, <laughs> I you can't know, spell it. No, <laughs> we would play at free festivals, you know, and that sort of thing, and, and not many bands of our stature would do that, really. Well, they did actually, Hawkwind were known t for doing things mm. like that, standing yeah. up, because there was once, it, was it uh, Isle of Wight, somewhere where there was people mm. had to pay, and, and Hawkwind said right. no. Yeah, and the, the first time that they put a fence around a, a, free, around a festival, a free mm. festival was the Isle of Wight. Mm. In yes. Hawkwind's early days, they played on a flatbed outside the gig as a protest. Mm. Mm. Yes, to and Jimi Hendrix to came to that. Yeah, didn't he? yeah. 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 yeah that's, uh, that was the so start of So that was the start of festivals as we know them today. Then, yeah, the, yeah, the record companies realised that they were losing money from people who could be paying admission fees. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. And it was, and wow, what yeah. admission fees now? £160. Well, yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. So it's all changed. I mean, it's like uh, years ago, we, were, we sort of headlined Glastonbury, and I think there was about 50,000 people there, 70,000, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that was what, 81, 1981. Yeah, it was. And I went two years ago to play there as a solo thing, and, um, and it's like nearly 200,000 people there. Yeah. You know, it's become a rite of passage for young people all around the world. Oh, go and spend days at Glastonbury yeah, absolutely. and make a mess. You know, yeah. the place is just a tip. Yeah. You know, it's awful. <laughs> it's just yeah. awful. But really. was it like for you going back and playing? Because, I mean, it's quadrupled in size of the yeah, people. Yeah, well, you know, yes, and so many more stages as well. So yeah. much more going on. And it's quite entertaining if you, you know, if, if you enjoy that. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, to go and see a band, I, I'd never seen Stevie Wonder live and he was headlining yeah. that yeah. year. And I thought it'd be really nice to be, only there were so many people you there. I could hardly see him, he was about that big <laughs> on the stage, you yeah. know. I mean, they've got big screens to the side, so you, you may as well take a video and stick yeah. it on, and yeah. yeah, you know. Well, you've mentioned now, like uh, you were telling me about the security there, and mm. how years ago you could just wander about yeah. and go and see whoever you wanted. And although you can to some extent, even you experienced yeah. driving in to actually play there. Yeah, you got the wrong vehicle pass. You can't go there. Yeah. And by the way, can I have your autograph? <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. not for me. It's for my mum. <laughs> <laughs>
Mm. So it's a lot more. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, it doesn't matter who you are. I don't uh, think. You know, I was sort of there in the theatre field. I was camped in the theatre field where all the theatre performers and circus people are, and um, you needed a pass to get in to yeah. that field. So yeah. if you weren't involved in the theatre field itself, you didn't, you couldn't, you weren't allowed in because no. I'd asked a friend to come and play with me there and play some music there and uh, they wouldn't let him in because he didn't have the right pass. And he was a, he was also was a member, Nick, yeah, yeah, yeah. ex-hot win member. Yeah. Yeah. I was, and who would you go to in that circumstance then to say, well, hang on, let's sort this out? You Michael know. Evis against Michael. <laughs> 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 I've got the wrong bus pass. And, yeah. But it's not <coughs> just And, and he'd say, it's nothing to do now, with me, it? it's my daughter that runs it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. fantastic. So yeah. back to the book then. <laughs>